morning, Bethlehem Baptist Church. It's great to be with you again. Well, over the last couple of weeks, we've been opening up the book of Colossians, and we've called the series Solus Christus because it stands in Latin for Christ alone. And today, as we look at these next five verses this morning, we find what really are some of the most beautiful, powerful, majestic scriptures that you'll find in all of scripture. And uh, for me, it's a little bit of a challenge because I feel rather unworthy to be describing to you these words that Paul has used to describe Jesus. Uh, I, I don't know about you, but there are times in nature when you go and you climb a hill and you get to the top and you see this incredible view of a mountain or a valley. And uh, maybe the, the, the view is accentuated by the fact that you've had to work hard to get to the top. Uh, but uh, today we're going to be doing a little bit of that. We're going to be working hard to get to the top so that we can have a view of what Paul is wanting us to see in Christ through these scriptures. Well, talking about mountain climbing, I'm going to start on a little mountain climbing expedition that the disciples went on with Jesus. Uh, back in Luke's gospel, you'll find that uh, Jesus took his friends, his closest friends, Peter, James and John, up to have a mountaintop experience. And uh, it's this experience that they found extremely difficult to describe. We call it the experience of the Mount of Transfiguration. So what I'd like us to do now is to have a look at Luke chapter 9, verse 29, and we'll see what this experience looked like for them. It says about Jesus that as he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor, talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. And Peter and his companions were very sleepy, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. Well, as you can see, here's a description of something that's quite indescribable. Uh, Jesus being literally transfigured, that is going from a state that we understand as, as flesh and blood into a transcendent state, an eternal state. And by doing so, uh, the writer, in this case Luke, is left in a position where it's very hard to describe this indescribable event. And so what we see here, though, is that Jesus is living in two worlds. He's uh, come from heaven and he's living here in two worlds. And he has a connection and a relationship and a conversation with two other people, uh, mainly Moses and Elijah, two people who have gone before him and have been living with him in heaven. And so we get this picture that Jesus is now uh, transcending all of these different uh, limitations that we have as people living here on earth. The other thing that's really important for us to remember is that Jesus was present right from the very foundation of the world. And this is our Trinitarian theology coming in here. So we're not talking about someone who's just been born in a stable and has accumulated a whole lot of knowledge and has been adopted by God. That in itself is heresy. But what we find is that Jesus was present with God at the time of the creation. So let's just have a look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, and we can see it very clearly there. Uh, it says there that, uh, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. Amen. So, so here we have uh, the description of mankind being made. But you notice there in the very first sentence, it says, God said, Let us make mankind in our image. He's using the plural there. Let us in our image. So clearly God isn't acting alone in as much as God is community, Father, Son, and Spirit. And so again, we get the reminder right from the beginning of Scripture that God is more than just the significant, uh, powerful, old man figure. God is found in Christ, and Christ is found in God. And that's the story that we're going to explore today. In fact, as we look at Colossians, what we're going to find is that these five verses that we look at today are actually a piece of poetry. In the original Greek, it would have been a poetic form in which these words were flowing out of Paul. And we're not sure whether Paul had made up this poem or whether it was a common poem that was being uh, used by the early church to describe this uh, supreme state of Jesus. 
But what we're going to find this morning is that uh, Paul is using poem to help us remember these very, very important words. So let me read to you from Colossians 1, 15 through to 17 and then into 20. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Wow, incredibly powerful description of whom Jesus is. And so what we're going to do this morning is we're going to, uh, I'm going to do my best to take us through some of this and help us understand the depth and the quality of what Paul is talking about. And the first thing I want to do is introduce you to a couple of words. And the first word is, is the word preeminent. Jesus is preeminent. And that means that Jesus is surpassing all others. He is high and above. But the other word that we have to capture here is Jesus being imminent. That means that he is immediately present with us. That means that he is both preeminent above all things, beyond all things, but he is also immediately with us. He is the Emmanuel, and that's where that word comes from. That means that he is, um, he is both with us and also above us. And so we live within this tension, this tension of where does Christ fit in our lives? Because if we see God as being preeminent, above us, what happens is we're left in this place where we, we try to make our own way to God because God just seems so far away. And so in a way, we create our own little stairway to heaven. And we do that by creating uh, religious structure. We do that by creating uh, ceremony. We do that by creating little things that we can tick off in our own mind and imagination that we feel draws us closer to God. So when we think of God being holy and almighty and majestic, we've got to remember that he is also in Christ found to be imminent. And that means he is immediately with us. Uh, and so we have this tension there because if we see as Jesus, see Jesus being uh, imminent in a way where we're overly familiar with him, uh, this diminishes who Christ is. And so for us as Christians, we don't worship a God who's too far, and therefore we create a little way in which we, a little stairway to heaven by which we will connect with him. Nor do we want to see Jesus overly familiar like some close friend who we just sort of lean in on and call him bro. Uh, that's not what it's all about either. So let's go back to Colossians chapter 1 verse 15 and see how we can unpack these verses. Paul says, The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation which is a fantastic sort of wow view of God, but it raises a question for us. Is it possible to have an image of that which is invisible? Let me give you an example of this. I, I could say to you, I've um, got this picture here of the invisible God. Would you like to see what that looks like? And you'll say, well, that just about sums up what invisible looks like, Craig. It's a big picture of nothing. And uh, we would, uh, you know, maybe in some circles I could sell it to you because I could convince you that it is a bit like the emperor's new clothes. I could tell you that it, there is something there. And if you were spiritual enough, you'd be able to see that. Now, that's obviously not what we're talking about here today, because what we're talking about is that Christ is the image of God, a God who is unknown, unseen, and therefore we could only speculate through the nature and character of his interactions with his people, the Jews, and particularly the day, and in his law and what he gave, we could only picture or piece together what it is that we saw God being because of his moral character, his laws, and the different things that he imposes upon us. And so we're left with this vague picture. But when Jesus came to be amongst us, 
um, we are given an impression of who God is in the flesh. And um, Philip, one of the disciples, had this conversation with Jesus as he was wrestling with who, who Jesus is. And uh, here we find Jesus having a conversation with Philip. And let's see what it is that Jesus said to Philip about this image of who he was. Uh, Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Wow. So here we have a- another powerful descriptor of, of Jesus describing his relationship with the Father. And for us as Christians, as we look in on these scriptures and we look in on this conversation that he was having with Philip, we see Jesus here intentionally saying that him and the Father are one. And that gives us great confidence because when we get to see the fullness of what Christ brings into our world, we realize that we're not dealing with someone who's just working on a delegated authority. We're dealing with God himself in Christ, God who has come in the flesh. And this is what Paul is wanting to demonstrate to us. When I was at uh, Baptist College, our principal there, Brian Smith, uh, had written a book called The Xerox Equation. And uh, this book was essentially a, um, a, a um, I suppose, a commentary of the book of John, the Gospel of John. And uh, Brian took great pleasure in using a analogy from the day. Uh, the photocopy machine was relatively new. I mean, it'd been around a while. But Brian would hold up two pieces of paper like this and say, "Now, here is the original, and here is a copy." Can you tell us which one is the original and which one is the copy? And of course, you can't tell them apart. And that's what Brian is saying to us today is that uh, when it comes to knowing God and Christ, we shouldn't be able to tell them apart because they are one and the same. What we are seeing is the invisible becoming visible, that God has now appeared amongst us in the flesh, and that takes on the form of Jesus. And I think it's a useful illustration because when when it comes to understanding the Trinity and the the nature of the relationship between God and Christ, uh, it's very easy to delegate those as something that's a line item where it's stepping down every time, but that's not the case. And uh, Paul is very, very strong on this. He's saying, look, in Christ we have God. In Christ, God is known to us. So, Let's push on a little bit and uh, see these next few verses that we've looked at this morning. Because uh, Paul gets deeper and deeper and he says this, For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. And we're like, Wow, you've got to be kidding me. How are we supposed to even breathe that stuff in? How are we supposed to get our heads around what's being described to us here is that uh, we're, we're trying to picture with our, our few centimeters of brain uh, how the creator of the whole universe has been functioning before time, before anything God was. And Jesus was there, present in that moment, uh, putting the creation into being. And therefore, by virtue of him being in that place, he is above all powers, all rulers, and all authorities. Again, going back to John's gospel, we find the opening few verses of John's gospel give us this equivalent picture. Uh, When John records the description of Jesus, right from the outset, he goes straight into this Christology, this understanding of Jesus, and he says this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and darkness has not overcome it. Again, all I can do is say, wow. Because what we're left with here is this impression and an image that Christ 
was in all things long before the creation of the world. And the word that's being used here to describe the word, um, it's easy to get confused here because the very opening verse says that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. Um, it's very easy for us to think that what's being said here is that in the beginning was the Bible and the Bible was with God. That, that's not what's being said. I mean, we can refer to the word of God as the word, that's fine, but it doesn't translate here. What is being said in the Greek is this. It said, in the beginning was the logos and the logos was with God. And the word logos is a Greek term which basically says uh, this, this logos is rational and it is the stabilizing principle of all the universe. Okay, It's rational and it's the stabilizing principle of all the universe. And I, and I think that's a wonderful description of who Christ is, stable, rational uh, principle of the uh, in and throughout the whole of the universe. And of course, when he was there at the beginning of the time, beginning of time, we can talk about this in universal terms, in eternal terms. Therefore, when we look at the scripture, we can see that Jesus is the centerpiece of all creation. That's what Paul is wanting us to see. He is trying to lift our eyes above the present, above the immediate, above this world, and project him back into time to remind us that he's the centerpiece of all creation, and through him all things were created, be them visible or invisible. And uh, when we talk about the visible and the invisible, of course, we, we start to sort of lose perspective because we can't see the invisible, but by faith we believe the invisible is there. I've used the illustration in the past that uh, if um, if this whole world was wiped out by a nuclear holocaust over a day, um, we would still survive, but we would be spirit. Okay, flesh would be gone. Okay, but spirit would survive. So the invisible would survive. So therefore, if we want to look at it, the invisible, the spiritual world, is more real than the world of the flesh, because it would survive a nuclear holocaust. But maybe something a little bit more simpler I can use here. Let's have a look at a, um, a spider's web, and I'll use this for two different reasons. Firstly, it gives us the center, and if you like, you could see Christ at the center of the spider web. Imagine that spider web is the universe. Uh, what we've got here is Christ at the center of the creation, and from there, everything has radiated out, and that has given us the universe in which we live, uh, not only... Um, would that be the universe in which we live, but uh, eon upon eon of time. So we've got the depth of time in there as well, which the illustration can't serve us for that purpose. But the reason why I chose the spider's web is because the spider's web is made up of the visible and the invisible. The web has holes in it, and those holes serve the web because if the, uh, the web was completely uh, full and it didn't have holes in it, it wouldn't serve its purpose, would it? Um, the web would be seen and the, the, uh, the, the purpose of it being a trap wouldn't be useful. But here we've got the visible and the invisible working together to serve the purpose. And so when we're talking about the visible and the invisible and the universe around us that Christ is in control of, I sort of felt that this was a, a helpful parallel. Never perfect because we're talking about things that are uh, intangible to us or or only can be seen through an opaque window, as Paul said to the Corinthians. So let's go back to our text and let's recapture these words once again because Paul is really wanting us to see this, not only with our head but with our heart. For in him, that's Jesus, all things were created things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Now, for Paul, here he is not only talking about principalities and powers that are of eternal value, but he's talking and addressing powers and principalities that are of the immediate present reality here in Rome. And uh, Paul, Paul knows full well that the Christian church is being birthed in a, an environment of persecution straight away. The Romans don't want to know him. The Jews don't want to know. And yet Paul is talking about Christ having authority over all these things because these were part of the created order. And so you know, here we've got a picture of uh, Caesar Augustus. Now, he could have been one of the, any of these Caesars in around the time. Um, but uh, like other Caesars, 
Um, Paul is saying, listen, we may be under some level of persecution, but we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers of darkness, against principalities and powers. And so Christ has dominion over all of these as well. So even in your persecution, you can rest in the fact that Christ is above all of these things. But here, Paul takes a turn. Because what Paul is doing now is he's taking this conversation and this description of Jesus, which we're talking about things way out in the universe, things from the dawn of time that Christ has been present. And now now Paul wants to bring us straight back and bring Jesus straight back to our immediate reality. And the next verse does that. In Colossians 1.18, he says, And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the first born from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. So here, once again, we get this picture of Christ being imminent, i.e. he's the, the head of the church. He's right here now amongst us. He's the one we look to as we develop this faith in Christ in, in this uh, community called the church. Uh, so he is imminent. He's immediately present. He's powerful. And, uh, and, and not only that, but Paul in the same sentence says that um, he is the firstborn from among the dead so that in everything he might have supremacy. So here we have this preeminence again. And Paul is inviting that church to live with a worldview that reminds us that God in Christ has been with us forever. And if he's been on this journey with us forever, then he can be trusted. We can have confidence in him. And his immediacy means that he's the one who brings comfort to us. And so Paul has told us that Christ was there at the creation as the firstborn of that creation. And now he's been telling us that he's the firstborn of the dead. So here's a little summary of just two verses. He says, not only the firstborn over all creation, but the firstborn from among the dead. And when we look at that, that should give us um, huge encouragement because Jesus is this prototype. He was the firstborn over all creation. Okay. And when we look at all creation around us, we see, man, look at, look at, look at what the firstborn is given. The firstborn as a, as a created being and us as created beings. Uh, There's plenty of people around us. This earth is filled with created beings. And then we get told that he's the firstborn from among the dead. So that should give us confidence about our eternal life. Because just as we have uh, population here on earth, so if he's the firstborn from among the dead in the heavenly realms, we can expect to meet plenty of people there as well because he leads the charge. He is the firstborn, the prototype of this new humanity that has been created by God, both in this world and in the world to come. And so Paul is saying um, that he's the the leader of the church. And when we look at uh, our church, here's a picture of uh, some folks from our church. Uh, This is obviously before social distancing was important. Um, But here we have a picture of our church, our folk. And Christ is the head of each individual, but he's the head also of our community. And this is vitally important because we never want to lose sight of the fact that Christ is the head of the church. Why would I or any other church leader want to get in the way of somebody who has uh, a reputation, a CV, uh, as big as Jesus? Okay, If he's been around since the dawn of creation, uh, having been the creator himself, then we want him to have the full rule and reign, don't we? So Paul presses in, and Paul now takes us back to where we should be finding ourselves uh, totally blown away because Paul is wanting us to once again remind us. You can see the journey that he's taking us on. He's taking us from um, out into the in the eternal world and uh, in, in the before, prehistory world, and then he takes us to the church. He reminds us that he's preeminent and he's imminent. And now he's reminding us again that God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. And we're going, you're kidding me. You mean God who created everything, God who just pulled everything together, he is fully found in Christ. Now, this is enough to blow our little minds, that in Christ, God was pleased to have all of his fullness dwell in him, in him, Jesus, by being full and fully God. By being full and fully God. 
So he is fully God and full of God. Does it make sense? Fully God and full of God. And now this final verse rolls on from here because it describes it this way. And through him, this God who is fully God and full of God, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. And this should give us tremendous confidence because who above all people, only Christ, who is full of God, could make a full reconciliation for us. And uh, I suppose in summary, we could say this, that Jesus has reconciled and restored to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Jesus has reconciled and restored the harmony of the original created order. And only somebody who is filled with God, only someone who is fully God, could actually do that in a full and complete way. And that's why the cross is so powerful. That's why the cross is so central. Because here at the cross have we been forgiven. Here at the cross we have been reconciled with God. So that everything that we have done that separated us from God has been paid for. And so Jesus, by doing so, um, restores that harmony of the original created order. And our mind and our image goes back to the Garden of Eden, where we remind ourselves that there, in the cool of the evening, Adam and Eve walked and talked with God. This is what this is all about. Never lose that, Im- that image in your mind, that this is what it is all about. God so desperately wants relationship with us, desperately wants that to be restored in such a way that he would send his son to pay the price for us so that ultimately we can walk and talk with God. That's the restoration. That's the harmony of the original created order that God has given us. And so these lofty, lofty, powerful images that Paul has placed in front of us to digest, and they are hard to digest because they are so full, are all there to remind us that this God who's been in Christ since the beginning of time gave himself for us that we might be friends with God. Let me pray. Father, as we look at these words, we we can do nothing more than go, wow. Wow, wow. How can you build an image for us, Lord, of who Jesus was, who he is, and who he is to be? Lord, we just pray that we can grasp with our imagination just what it is that Paul was wanting to say to us through these scriptures. And we can appreciate just how powerful and how complete and how whole our salvation is. That Jesus, being God, came, humbled himself upon a cross, that we might be born again, that we might be fully human, that harmony is restored, relationship is restored, the created order is restored, that we found in Christ are restored to God. Let that be our peace. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.